greetings to the organizers i am anvesha das gupta research scholar department of political science presidency university and assistant professor department of political science netaji shatwash kumar vidyalay kolkata the paper i am going to present today is titled alluding alliance the indo us trajectory in the new decade I will hereby start with my introduction. As we all know that the Indo-US relation has developed in leaps and bounds over the years from the disengagement and hostility of the Cold War to the current defining partnership of the 21st century. And this growing bonhomme has often made us wonder that if situations arise are we going to witness a formal alliance between india and the united states with turn of another decade the international system is presented with emergence of serious challenges and threats in the form of russian aggression in ukraine consistent chinese border incursions and expansion in central and south asia or the taliban upsurge in afghanistan such threats pose serious concern to maintenance of security and stability and other global and regional interests to both india and the united states however despite the emergence of such mutually compelling threats we are not witnessing any signs of a formal alliance between india and the united states and their reactions or their uh approach to such compelling threats have been quite informal and piecemeal given the efforts of building a pronounced strategic partnership over the years to cooperate over common interests and to mitigate threats to those the question remains is why we are not being able to witness a formal alliance even when presented with such emerging threats In this article, I will argue that despite the emergence of mutual threats like the rise of Islamic fundamentalism through resurgence of Taliban or Chinese regional aggression, formation of a formal Indo-US alliance has not occurred in the light of four points. Firstly, there remains fundamental difference over long-term strategic perspectives, given one being a superpower and the other a rising power. secondly because of such fundamental differences in their strategic perspectives there remains a variance in their outlook of strategic thinking thirdly they differ in the specific kind of international system they wish to uphold or they wish to continue and fourthly because of such lingering fundamental strategic differences whenever they identify an issue of congruence or common interests the approaches to those remains quite different for them i will now move on to a brief introduction to the concept of alliance in international politics alliance is quite an age old uh, concept in international politics and can be very Uh, shortly described as a formal agreement between two or more states for mutual support mainly to deter a common adversary however there remains quite an ambiguity regarding the content and the definition of an alliance in international politics and many scholars have presented their own versions of it for example stephen walt defines alliance as a formal or informal relationship of security cooperation between two or more sovereign states according to arnold wolfers in technical language of statesmen and scholars the term alliance signifies a promise of mutual military assistance between two or more sovereign states by which a nation formally promises to join another in fighting a common enemy bruce m russet defines alliance as a formal agreement among a limited number of countries concerning the conditions under which 
they will or will not employ military force. So from such definitions, if we kind of try to sum up uh, a small definition of alliance, it seems that alliance remains to be a formal agreement between sovereign states with security cooperation, military cooperation, and deployment of force and identification of the common enemy being one of the being the key ingredients of such a formal agreement. Next, we move on to see why the Indo-US relations, which we often cite as a example of engagement and negotiations and the height it has reached in current days, why we cannot still call it an alliance. Firstly, they do not fulfill the basic criteria of having a formal agreement on military cooperation, according to Rasat. However, their defense cooperations or their joint military exercises that they are engaging each other, they still do not have a formal agreement on military deployment or force deployment if such situation arises. Secondly, such as Wolfers points out, they haven't still identified a common enemy or a common threat publicly. Though China remains a, uh, an issue of concern for both, but they haven't publicly gone to announce China as a security threat, and rather they try to maintain their own bilateral relationships with the Chinese government. Now, however, it has been quite argued that the emergence of more compelling security threats like uh, rise of fundamentalist Islamic regime in Pakistan or Chinese regional aggression might lead India and the United States to finally upgrade their partnership into an alliance. Now, hereby I present that the current international system actually is witnessing the rise of such compelling threats. Firstly, the resurgence of Taliban in Afghanistan after two decades of serious commitment to democratize and restructure the Afghan state not only presents a major setback to US policy of maintaining stability, but a bigger threat arising in India in the view of the new opportunities for rise of Islamic fundamentalism, which can easily percolate from Afghanistan to Pakistan. Secondly, the Chinese border in concerns has increased in the last few years, and it has also increased its regional assertiveness, which jeopardizes Indo-US commitment to maintain stability and security in Asia Pacific. And thirdly, the Russian attack on Ukraine, though it's far off, but has resulted in a war, which further complicates the interdependent nature of the current international system, national system. So despite the rise of such potent immediate common threats, the Indo-US responses have remained quite loosely defined, flexible, with no signs of upgrading into a formal alliance. The asymmetry in power and strategic perspectives limit their chances to consider a threat in the same magnitude and security. And now I will try to explain that why we are not witnessing an alliance or why, the, why we are not seeing any sign of Indo-US relations upgrading into an alliance. The first and foremost reason I state here is the fundamental difference in the strategic world. In the post-Cold War era, when US became the predominant power, the primary strategic objective of the United States was to maintain an international system with preponderance of American power and to promote its values among people and other sovereign states and to shape an international environment which will be conducive to its interests in the future. Closely following the construction of an international system conducing to American interests is prevention of the rise of competitors in regional or global level that might have the potential to threaten US primacy globally or in a region. 
and following from the first to the third major prerogative or a constructive American strategy is to forward interest and to address any form of challenges or non-conformity is to accommodate them into a system of alliance or to work through multilateral cooperation. Now, in contrast, if we place India's strategic worldview, we will see that India's strategic thinking from the very beginning has been informed by the perception of the international system as a hegemonic one, imposing its norms and wills on other developing states. Secondly, the core of India's strategic worldview is its enduring and deep-rooted aspiration of achieving the status of a major power within the international system. Closely following its quest to attain a major power status, it is desired to maintain its independence in foreign policy, which we often term as strategic autonomy. Hence, being a confirmative ally or a satellite state is quite non-consistent with India's strategic thinking. So one might ask that why in the recent years we have seen America being quite supportive to India's rise, even the Bush administration formally made a uh, declaration that it will help India rise. One argument we can put here is that United States thinks if it assists India to rise, it will make India's rise within a limited structure which will be conducive to American interests. However, it doesn't understand that India's quest for attaining a major power status is based on its very core objective of maintaining strategic autonomy. It wants to be a distinct power on its own, which clashes with United States fundamental strategic perspective of limiting the rise of peer competitors. Now we go to the second aspect, which is their divergent perspectives of the international system. As we have seen their differences in strategic world, which also informs the kind of international system they wish to uphold. For the United States being the dominant power of the international system, since the end of the Cold War, it has carefully constructed the structures and norms of the current international system to serve its interest. Hence, it stresses on the preservation of the same system and it seeks status quo. The key to this order is to be able to pursue its interest in part by creating and maintaining a web of institutions, norms, and values, which constructs a framework that shapes much of the international politics. It tries to provide security and guarantee to its allies so that they do not uh, try to threaten or Toward American interests and the kind of order it has ensured over the years have become a norm in the present international system. India being an emerging power eager for status and recognition has always advocated an international system with multiple centers of power. It pushes for a multiple world order in which it seeks in which it sees that it will provide more, greater strategic flexibility. It will be not only conducive to the rise of a new power, but also be conducive in allowing that power to rise on its own terms without an overarching structure of international system maintained by a predominant power. India voices its concern over biases in the international order and also invests in being part of indigenous regional initiatives. It has long been quite vocal against the biases and the prejudices against developing states in the current international system. India strives to bring about alteration in the current structure through two distinct ways we can actually see. Firstly, it tries to induce changes in norms and rules by working within established institutions through negotiations or by building sub forums with others, as we can see in WTO or the new Quad, or how India, along with other developing countries like China, Brazil, they try to uh, 
present their opinion about climate change or uh, the biases to intellectual property rights or agriculture. So it tries to change the norms by working with other powers within the established structures of the international system, that is one. Secondly, it tries to construct and participants in indigenous regional attempts to form new organizations or institutions that can provide alternative approaches to address the concerns. So not only it participates in the established norms to change it, to bring about a change in this, it also participates in forming new organizations that are indigenous in nature. They have niche regional policies to provide an alternative. We see BRICS, we see IPSA, we see, Mar uh, we see BIMSTEC, where India is participating with other, other regional powers to bring about a change or provide an alternative to the current international structure, which it thinks is quite tilted towards the great powers or the preponderant power. Given such differences in their strategic worldview and the kind of international system they seek to uphold, the next point I raise is the altered approaches to areas of conflicts. That is, even when they try to underline an area or identify an area of congruous or common interest because of their differences in opinion about strategic thinking or perspectives, we often see them, we often see that their approach to such areas of congruence remains very divergent and the outcomes or the agreements are often very specific or modified versions to suit the interest of the group. For instance, I cite here the case of Limua, that is a logistic agreement that was signed with United States and India in 2016, highlights how an India-specific version of the original logistic support agreement or the LSA was put to effect to address the concern on both sides. United States has three fundamental uh, defense agreements with all its allies throughout the world. But when it tried to confirm it with that of India, the concerns were raised against it. And hence, the original logistic supports agreement was transformed, modified to suit the Indian concerns and also to serve the American interests. And Limua was born. The Limua, which was signed, which permits the US and India to use each other's facilities and provides for easier access to supplies and services for the military forces of the two countries when they're engaged in specific type of activities. But for any other requirement, it has to be agreed on both sides on a case by case basis. Thus, Limoa is not as binding as LSA, which is a formal agreement between two states. Limoa has kept its flexibility open, whereby both the states can uh, decide on the rights and wrongs and deal with each case in a piecemeal way. So Limo is much more flexible and limited in scope than LSA, but it satisfies the US interest of having a logistics agreement in place and also address the Indian concern of entering into a formal binding agreement related to security. So here I bring about the point that because of their lingering fundamental difference over, over strategic perspectives, over the long-term uh, worldview that they have and the kind of international system they would like to work in. Their cooperation or areas of congruence also reflects their chosen outlook of having a flexible alignment over a binding formal agreement. So their initiatives of cooperation remain quite informal, loosely defined and flexible in nature to accommodate their divergences and distinct long-term visions and interests. Secondly, trade-offs or positive incentives which are used as to enhance an alliance as defined by Moro uh, might accelerate or strengthen the cooperation 
in case of India and the United States, but formally acknowledging to support each other across diverse issues remains a distant idea because they think very differently from each other. Hence, having an alliance in place is acknowledging that we are going to support each other over a long range of issues, which United States and India after many years of cooperation are still not ready. So a formal binding alliance would con continue to elude India and the United States as long as their difference in entrenched strategic thinking, power asymmetry will continue. And uh, with that, I will end my presentation. Thank you, everyone.